everyone, welcome back to Lavender. So you may or may not know that I recently went on a trip to Japan. So I thought it'd be a good idea to show you how I plan for my trips. So it's gonna be a lot of information. I think I'm gonna break this down into two videos. So this first video is in partnership with Hello Talk, and I'm gonna show you my best tips on booking flights, accommodations, budgeting, and just other important things to do before you go on your trip. The second video is gonna be more about like researching where to go, planning out your itinerary, figuring out transportation, your phone, your internet, and just other fun stuff. FYI, these tips are based on my personal experience. I can't claim that I'm like a travel expert or anything, but I can say that I do travel more than the average person, I would say. I've been to 27 countries so far, and I travel multiple times a year, and I've been doing this for like eight or nine years or so. So let's get to it. My favorite website to check for flight prices is called Skyscanner. And the reason why I love Skyscanner so much is because they have this monthly view of flight prices. So I'm gonna put LAX to Japan, or no, let's do Tokyo here, which is the trip that I took. Click on this button right here that says show whole month. And this is crucial. I personally like non-stop flights only, so I'm gonna check that. You can leave it unchecked and you see the prices are cheaper. So what I love about this is that, say you wanna book for December, it might get pretty pricey. Oh, it's not that pricey. And so here it says 196 if you leave on this Sunday and then it's 196 to return on this date. So the total would be 392. And then, I mean, you can play around with other dates as you can see, just look at whatever's the cheapest option if that matters to you, which I think it does. Oh, nope, it went up. So this is 190 and now this is 246. So you just play around with the prices here and figure out what's the best option for you. One thing I do have to say is this is not usually the final price. For some reason, when you click show flights, you're gonna see prices that are more expensive, but looking at the monthly view just gives you a good idea on when the price range is cheaper for yourself, but you always have to check the final price as well. So here you can see like the best option they recommend is this one because it's a non-stop flight, and this is the cheapest, but it has like a huge layover. I mean, 26 hours to travel. I don't think anybody wants to do that. So just, I mean, if you do, then great. But mostly like I like to travel nonstop, one stop at the minimum. So you can, you know, adjust your options here. So usually I feel free to book directly through Skyscanner. As you can see, it takes you to this other website where the total is what it said on Skyscanner. If you don't feel comfortable booking through these random budget websites, then another thing that I'll do sometimes is I'll just use Skyscanner to check prices, and then I will go to something like Expedia where I'm more comfortable booking tickets from there. As you can see, this flight that's on Skyscanner, ANA operated by United, is $722, but if you go to Expedia, this same flight, this is basically that same flight, the United one operated by ANA, is $775. So you can see that sometimes other websites are more expensive, so that's why I like to check Skyscanner. It basically scans the entire web for the cheapest price. Another thing that's really important to note is whenever you're looking up flight prices, use an incognito window. That way your browser doesn't track what you're researching because these websites, they put cookies, I don't know how cookies work, but basically they track your searches and they can tell when you're searching for this specific flight, they're like, oh, this person wants to go on this flight. So they will raise the price just for you because they know that you want it so badly. Like there have been times where like, I've noticed that my price on my computer is a lot higher than like the price on my friend's computer because my browser was being tracked. Another app that's helpful is called Hopper and Hopper is an app that helps predict future airfare prices and basically you can input whatever flights you're interested in and then it will send you a notification when the price drops to its lowest point. So that's something to check out if you're interested. And if you're super flexible, you don't really care where you're going, you just want to get a cheap flight ticket to anywhere, something fun you can do on Skyscanner is you can click here and then can't decide where. So basically you search everywhere and you can search like for the whole month of say January. And what it will do is it will give you the lowest prices 
ever, like from your airport. So as you can see, there are a lot of cheap flights in the United States. Um, Mexico is cheap, Canada, Puerto Rico, Guatemala, Cuba, Iceland, $300 for a flight to Iceland from LA. That's pretty cheap, non-stop whoa so then you click into it and then you kind of just like play around with this and this and you see how this says 341 um wow <laughs> it's actually operated by wow airlines i've taken that airline before it's a budget airline let me just say that <laughs> another website worth looking into is the scottscheapflights.com and Basically, you enter your email and then they will send you flight deals to your email and that's just something if you guys are interested in that sort of thing. My next tip is to familiarize yourself with the language, at least learn the basics because that can get you pretty far. So depending on where you're going, like maybe it's a place that speaks another language that you do not understand, it's important to remember that you know even though English is spoken by a lot of people around the world, you shouldn't expect everyone to know English when you travel. I feel like a lot of Americans, they travel and they expect everyone to be able to understand or speak English where it's like, why would you expect people of that when you don't speak their language? So anyway, I think it's important to always be culturally sensitive and to do your best. Learn how to say the basics like, hello, thank you, excuse me, where's the bathroom or where can I get food? These are really important questions that will get you far and it's like people like you better for trying to speak their language. So think of all the phrases that might come in handy when you're traveling, maybe when you're lost or you need to find a bathroom or water whatever it may be like write down a list of phrases that you will translate and here I'm using the hello talk app to translate phrases because what that app does is it can read back those phrases to you so you can practice like just copying and following along with that language it also saves those phrases for you in the app and you can favorite those phrases so that you can just always have them on your phone when you're on the go I know a lot of you are interested in learning new languages, so this is actually a really cool app that can do so much more than just translating. So HelloTalk is actually a language and cultural app that has over 7 million users where you can basically practice a language by chatting with a native speaker who wants to learn your language. So it's kind of like a language swap where you are practicing this language with a native speaker, but they also want to learn your native language, so you correct them and they correct you. So first you set your native language and then you set the language that you want Want to learn and then the app will suggest a bunch of language partners that you can practice with and you can also browse moments which is kind of like a social news feed of other people's posts on the app so that's a really easy way to get your feet wet in this app without having to directly chat with people what you can do is you just browse people's moments and you can like correct people's english and you can post things in your language or another language and people can correct you and as you're reading other people's moments if you don't understand what they're saying there are options to translate it and also do transliteration which is kind of like pronunciation for these words in your language and the app can also like read out the post for you so you can practice like speaking out this language by the way if the thought of connecting to random strangers is kind of nerve-wracking there are options to filter out people who can find you so i personally set the filter like same gender only and then i reduce the age range of people who can reach out to me because i feel more comfortable talking to people who are around my age and people who are females just because like when i first opened the app i got like a lot of messages from guys from china and it kind of like overwhelmed me and made me feel weird in some way so i just do whatever makes you feel comfortable like i feel comfortable just chatting with girls because that's just how it is for me. So if you're interested in checking out HelloTalk and practicing a new language, chatting with the locals in that area, definitely click that link down below. You can also like ask them for recommendations in the city that you're going to. That's another option, like just connecting with people who actually live in the place that you're traveling to. Next, let's move on to booking accommodations. And for me, it's all about location. It's all about finding a place in the perfect location that is very, very convenient to everything that you wanna see during your trip. Personally, I've stayed in hostels, bed and breakfast, Airbnbs, and hotels. And I don't know if there are other types of options out there. Like I've never tried couch surfing. That's a thing if you wanna like stay on someone's couch. But personally, I think Airbnb is 
my perfect medium. I That's my favorite way to travel now because I like being able to stay in like an apartment type setting and Airbnbs are usually cheaper than hotels but they're usually just as clean and organized and you have just as much privacy. So before you decide where to stay, it's important to have an idea of the spots that you want to see while you're traveling. So I would do a quick research on like top things to do in the city or just have a list of things that you want to see and then map it all out on Google Maps so you can see if it's in any specific area of the city and you'll see like where you'll more likely be hanging out. So for example, on my recent trip to Tokyo, I knew I wanted to stay on the west side of Tokyo because I love the areas Shibuya, Harajuku, and Shinjuku. And basically there are like a lot of things to do on the east side of Tokyo, but I knew that I was gonna frequently go back to places on the west side. So that's where I wanted to book around. Another important thing is if you're planning on taking metro and public transportation is to find a place that is close to a metro station. By close, I mean walking distance less than seven minutes. I If it's longer than seven minutes, like you're exhausted at the end of the day, you don't want to walk 15 to 20 minutes after your station to get to your place. Like sometimes I've done that, it's just really annoying, it's just so nice to live right next to the station. And the pro tip on top of that is to stay near a station that's on a major line that you know you're going to be using frequently. So this is going to take some research. You can totally ask anyone who's a local in that area if you can. For example, in Tokyo, one of the main metro lines that will basically take you to all the most important places is the JR Yamanote line, and that's the green line that goes in this circle. Another example is if you go to Taipei, the blue line is the line that is most frequented if you're planning to see those tourist attractions so my friends recommended that I stay near the blue line and it really makes a huge difference because if you're staying even close to a metro station but it's on a line that is further away from everything you're gonna always be like transferring to that major line so it just depends on how much you care about being convenient to the places that you want to see for me I've learned to just find a place near a metro station, preferably on one of the main lines that I know I'm gonna be taking all the time. So let's jump into Airbnb where we're gonna find a place to stay. When, and hopefully you have the dates that you're going. So it's pretty straightforward to use Airbnb. Let's put two guests, amenities like internet. So this is my secret for booking Airbnbs. Instead of like just looking through the places like this, although you can do that because it's cute to look at photos, what I do is I zoom into each metro station. So I've already done my research and I know that I want to stay along this Yamanote line that's near Shibuya station. So I have a lot of options because here's Shibuya and the line goes like all the way up to here and then all the way down here, and then it makes like a circle through there. But I don't wanna stay on this side of the line, I wanna stay this side of the line, a few stops away from Shibuya. Basically, on Airbnb, I'm gonna start like going into each metro station along that line and looking in the immediate area of the apartments there. So normally, I would click on like the cheap options look through the photos, do I like this? Maybe, and I'll just open the ones that are interesting on a new tab. So for example, if I don't see anything that I like around the Yoyogi area, then I would just go down. This is Harajuku. Um, I know that it's really busy here, but I mean, if it's worth a look to like check out all these different places. So for my recent trip, I actually stayed down here by this station, Meguro. Another thing I pay attention to in the listings is they usually tell you how long it takes to walk to the nearest station. Sometimes if they don't say how long it takes to walk, I have a feeling that the walk is pretty long because to be honest, Airbnbs, these points are not exact. They don't expose the address of the Airbnb until you book it. So I don't know if I would completely trust the location of this point. I mean, it's probably like a general area, but it's always like just more like 
safe to read the description of the listing. So this one says five minutes by foot from the station. And this one looks super sleek. And this one says three minutes to Meguro Station. Another thing that I really care about is reading reviews. So I love seeing four and a half to five star reviews for the place that I'm staying in. There have been times where I've stayed at a place where there were no reviews because it was a new home. So it's been like a hit or miss. Sometimes they're great, but sometimes like if there's no reviews, it could be like kind of dirty and the place might not match the photos. So just keep in mind that it's always like a risk. You're always taking a gamble. Sometimes places don't look exactly like the photos, but if a listing has like really good reviews and you actually read through the comments and it sounds great, then I would trust that. By the way, if you guys do want to book through Airbnb, I have a free $40 travel credits that you can use. Just click the link down below, you'll find it. So free money, right? That's awesome. Moving on, let's talk about budgeting. So how much money should I budget for my trip? How much cash do I bring? These are questions that I always ask every time and it really depends on the location you're going to because some places are cheaper and some places are more expensive. That's just how it is. But what I would do is I would look up the average price for meals in your city that you're visiting. So look up the average price for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then you can calculate yourself like, okay, if I'm gonna spend $10 on breakfast, 15 on lunch, 15 on dinner, so that's like $40 a day for food, and I'm sure there's a lot of wiggle room in there for other stuff as well. It, it really depends on you. I'd also look up prices for everything that you wanna do. So museum ticket prices, just excursion prices, things like that so you can add that in your budget as well so food activities and transportation so whether you're planning on taking metro or taxi uber or even renting a car that cost goes into it as well lastly how much do you want to shop so factor that into the budget as well the tricky part for me is deciding how much cash to bring and how much i should rely on credit card some places don't accept credit card as widely as other places so this really depends on your own research on the city that you're visiting are you gonna be able to use your credit card? The best general tip I can give is make sure you get a credit card that has no foreign transaction fee. So I use the Chase Reserve card. Um, there are a ton of other travel cards out there, but just make sure you get one that has zero foreign transaction fee because why pay for extra fees like that? Another thing I always do is I order foreign currency at my bank because the rates are generally like the cheapest if you get it from your bank at home. I don't recommend exchanging your money at airports or any touristy places because usually the rate, like the conversion rate they charge you is much higher. It's just better for you to order foreign currency at your bank before your trip. And it usually takes your bank like seven days or so. So order it like two weeks in advance. My last money tip is to have the currency conversion app on your phone so you know exactly what the conversion rate is and when you're looking at the prices in this foreign area, like you know how to do the conversion in your head or just do it on your phone really quickly, you know, because it's helpful. My last tip is on handling important documents and this is just a personal tip that I think everybody should do just to prepare themselves and protect themselves. So all of your important documents have a photocopy on your phone and online. Take photos and screenshots of your passport, boarding pass, ID, visa, the address of the place you're staying, directions to the place you're staying, and any other important documents or health insurance, things like that, because you never know if you're gonna lose something. You always wanna have a copy of all of your important documents and you want to have a copy on your phone hidden somewhere and a copy like online on the cloud whether it's in Dropbox, Google Drive or sent to yourself in your email. That way you can access it from anywhere around the world. You might also want to consider keeping emergency phone numbers on your phone and online in part of that cloud storage because you never know what's going to happen and you want to have those numbers with you and also keep like a written copy of these important numbers in your wallet or something in case anything happens to you. All right, that's it for this video, but keep an eye out for the next video, which is going to be on researching where to go, planning your itinerary, transportation, phone, internet, and just other fun stuff like planning your Instagram photos while you travel. By the way, if you're actually planning a trip, I have a packing checklist you can download right here. It basically is a checklist of all the things that you should bring while you're traveling. All right, that's it for this video. Have a beautiful day and safe travels. Bye.
Thank you.